welcome everyone to the uh, Rappahannock Valley Civil War Roundtable. Tonight, we have a, uh, a speaker who's been here in the past, uh, Robert Dunkerley, Bert Dunkerley. He's a historian, author, and speaker, uh, actively involved in historic preservation and research. Uh, he's a ranger at the uh, Richmond National Battlefield Park and uh, he has a degree in history from St. Vincent, excuse me, St. Vincent College. And I believe that's in Pennsylvania. Yep. And a master's in historic preservation from Middle Tennessee State University. He's worked at nine historic sites, written 11 books and over 20 articles. And he also has visited over 400 battlefields and 700 historic sites worldwide. So he's well-read and well-traveled. He last visited, visited us in uh, 2015 with a program on Surrenders of the Confederacy and has also spoken to us in the past about Stones River in Tennessee. So, Bert Dunkerley. And tonight he's going to speak to us about the Browns Island Explosion of 1863. Take it away, Bert. All right. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And I'm going to start out here by setting up the PowerPoint. There we go. So what I want to do is uh, something a little different here. I'm going to talk about the Browns Island explosion and, and what happened and what we know about it. But I also want to focus on the victims and the research that I did to try to identify the victims and um, more importantly, find out if I could where they are buried, which was a really interesting process that I'll take you through tonight. So, let's see here. Oh. This is a map of downtown Richmond during the Civil War. And Browns Island is an island in the James River. It's in the lower left corner. Uh, as if you look at this map here, and if you look closely, you might see that there's only one access, one uh, footbridge that, that leads to the island. Um, Tredegar Ironworks, which most of you probably are familiar with, was the, the large manufacturing center, is located just to the left. It's that cluster of black buildings that you see on the map, uh, just on shore uh, next, to the, next to Browns Island. Uh, this, this whole waterfront was an industrial center. It's one of the reasons why Richmond was so important and chosen to be the, the second capital of the Confederacy. When the war started, of course, there's a need for uh, in, industry and ammunition. And the Confederate government established what they called the laboratory, which did all kinds of, of work on munitions. And the laboratory was built on Browns Island, uh, just temporary structures that were put up to house the work. The laboratory is going to employ 600 people, half of them female. And that's because as the war goes on, we're gonna have conscription and uh, men are needed for the military and we have women available and willing to help. So uh, half the workforce here is going to be female. The uh, laboratory is divided into six different operations. It, it was a huge facility. One manufactured percussion caps, which were used to uh, fire rifles, small arms. Um, one manufactured various chemicals uh, that were used in the ignition systems of, of percussion caps and fuses for artillery shells. Uh, there was an artillery packing ammunition facility here, one concentrated on seacoast mortars, and one specialized in uh, breech-loaded weapons and pistol ammunition. So a lot of different things are going on here. This is a very important facility. A newspaper article at the time wrote this about Browns Island and the laboratory. Every department is well uh, and carefully heated for the winter. Those on the island are rendered comfortable by registers from the furnaces. 
Very few accidents have occurred at the laboratory since its establishment, much fewer indeed than might reasonably have been expected where so many raw hands have been necessarily employed. The establishment has been of inestimable service. We may say the salvation of the Confederacy. It is the general ordinance manufactory of the South. And just to give you an idea of how important the work here was and the scale of which they were working, um, they could produce about a million cartridges, small arms cartridges a month, a little over a million. And you might think, well, what are they doing with all this <laughs> ammunition? Um, soldier carries 40 rounds of ammunition in his cartridge box and you start doing the math, Army of Northern Virginia might have 60 to 70,000 men at any given time and early in the war. Um, the army would need about 3 million cartridges to fight a major battle like Fredericksburg or Antietam or something like that. Not to mention probably 40,000 or so rounds of artillery ammunition. And then there's all the garrison troops that are spread out throughout Virginia and the Carolinas. There's other detachments that are spread out. So it's not just the army in Northern Virginia, it's, it's the need for ammunition everywhere else. So tremendous amount of ammunition being produced here. It is incredibly important facility. Now, a word about the ammunition that they're preparing. Um, today, we classify, or I should say the, the ATF, classifies black powder, which is what they're using, as a class C explosive. It's not flammable, it's explosive. Uh, it's a certain type of um, propellant that is extremely sensible, sensitive to light, heat, and friction. And it obviously has to be handled very carefully. And today, uh, I work for the National Park Service, and we do historic weapons demonstrations, and we have certain guidelines that we follow. We follow ATF guidelines for handling and storing black powder, and the Park Service has its own standards that sort of dovetail with the ATF standards. They didn't have those in place in 1863. There's a war, and they're trying to produce things as quickly as they can. So. Uh, Things were not as safe as maybe they could have been. Here's a photograph, uh, shows you Brown's Island there in the center. And this was taken after Richmond was captured at the end of the war. So there's some visible damage you can see, but Brown's Island is, is in the middle there. And it was just a series of wooden structures, barrack type buildings. And, um, talked a lot about uh, the black powder, but there's other things being produced and used um, at Browns Island, including friction primers. And that's what you see on the top there of this kind of blurry picture. Uh, friction primer is used for firing artillery and it has an explosive chemical in that tube that when you pull the pin that you see there on one of those primers, that would set off the spark, which would then ignite the main charge in a uh, artillery shell. On the bottom, this illustration shows you a loading block. It's literally a wooden block with holes drilled in it uh, where you could insert cartridges or primers if you're working on in producing and packing the ammunition. Now, a lot of the, I mentioned a lot of the, the workers are, are women. They're actually teenage girls. Uh, the vast majority of them. And a lot of them are German and Irish immigrants. Uh, th that's the working class people who have settled in Richmond in the years before the war. And here's a picture of small arms cartridges, and cartridges, paper tube with gunpowder and a bullet inside. And they're sometimes tied up with strings, sometimes not. But here's a, a picture of small arms cartridges and this is a picture from a museum that I took. It just gives you a sense of what, what this work might have looked like. Uh, these ladies sitting around these long tables with ammunition, 
spread out all around them. Now, it's going to be Friday the 13th of March in 1863 when the explosion happens. Um, we have a lot of eyewitness accounts that talk about it, so there's really no doubt as to what happened. But before we get into the details of what happened, we need to know what did that room look like? And this is a sketch of who was in the room where and what they were doing based on eyewitness accounts. They were working in a room that was 100 feet by 50 feet, long and narrow building, wooden building with a, a stove at one end. It is March, so it is chilly. The stove is not the problem as far as safety though, because in this room, a lot of activities were going on that should not have been going on at the same time. We have people putting cartridges together. They're measuring out the gunpowder and securing it in those paper tubes. We have other people who are breaking open cartridges that are damaged or bad, rejected, whatever. And so they're pouring loose gunpowder out and then they're gonna recycle that into new cartridges. We have artillery friction primers being used or packaged here. And we have people sewing bags for artillery ammunition, the uh, linen bags that the shells would be put in. And accounts talk about there are boxes of cartridges and bulk boxes of powder all over the room. Uh, you know, black powder is, it's a powder, so it spills. So it's gonna be on the floor, it's gonna be all over the tables. And you see where this is going. Mary Ryan is a 19 year old Irish immigrant and she is working at the end of a long table and she is working with friction primers. And in the past, she had been um, reprimanded for being careless. And what she was doing is she's working with a block, a wooden block of friction primers, and they started to get stuck. So she banged them on the table and she was corrected for that, but she continued to do it. Mary Cunningham happened to be across the room at the far end and looked up to see Mary Ryan once again banging that block of primers on the table. And Catherine Cavanaugh was sweeping the floor behind her when a spark set off a massive explosion. Um, 10 were killed instantly. There were about 60 people in the room, which is another problem. There should have never been that many people in the room. A newspaper account recorded that the room was blown into a complete wreck. The roof lifted off, the walls dashed out, and the ruins falling upon the occupants. So the explosion blows out the roof and the walls, and then they come back in and collapse on the victims inside. Uh, another account talked about the most heart-rendering lamentations and cries from the sufferers rendered delirious from suffering and terror. <clears throat> Several of these uh, people will have their clothes caught on fire. Uh, some will <clears throat> jump into the James River and some will run around outside until other people help put their clothes out. Um, there were mostly women in this, this room. There were a few men and a few boys, but almost all of the victims are going to be female. This next picture shows you the site today. And if any of you have been to downtown Richmond on the waterfront, you may have walked by this spot. Uh, the city holds concerts and festivals here. It's, it's a big open uh, community space. But uh, I'm taking a picture looking towards the site of this building, this particular building that exploded. And that's my shadow in the lower left corner. Um, nothing marking the exact spot today. There is a historic marker nearby, however, 
And in the background, you can see that footbridge that goes over to the island. That's about the same place that the footbridge was there in 1863. So when the explosion happens, it's around 11 in the morning. And uh, the authorities immediately close off access to the island. They don't want family members and, and you know, the general public trying to get in there and see what's going on. Um, again, a newspaper reports that mothers rushed about uh, trying to get across that footbridge. So the explosion happens on the 13th and for the next 11 days, uh, the victims will be passing away. The first thing that happens is um, the wounded are going to be evacuated to the nearest facility that can treat them. And that happens to be just up the hill, a couple blocks away, General Hospital Number 2. Now, Richmond had uh, lots of hospitals that have been established to treat wounded soldiers. And they're, they're numbered General Hospital 1, 2, 3, and so on. And in the center of this photograph, that's General Hospital Number 2. Uh, if you know downtown Richmond, it stood on Cary Street. It was a tobacco warehouse before the war. So it's just a big brick building with a lot of open rooms inside that was used for processing tobacco. It's not necessarily a, a sanitary place. This hospital actually did not have a great record uh, before the explosion. Uh, the building had been inspected previously and the report noted the building is unsuitable. It would, would have been vacated, but for its convenience to the canal and railroad depots. It is for this reason that it has been the receptacle for the worst cases. And we know that General Hospital Number Two was specifically used for Mississippi soldiers. Uh, they tried to segregate soldiers by state, and that was often because the home states would send aid and uh, people to help give care. So these hospitals generally had men from the same state if they could do that. Arriving at General Hospital number two over the next couple of hours uh, are going to be several victims, all dreadfully burned. And a few of their names, George Chappelle, Sarah Haney, Hannah Petticord, Ella Bennett, Mary Jenningham, Julia Brennan, and one other female unable to give her name. We have no idea how they were set up in this hospital. Um, if they were separated from the soldiers, we have no idea the specific specifics of the treatment that they got. Again, I'll go back to the newspapers. Uh, some had an arm or a leg divested of flesh and skin. Others were bleeding with wounds received from the falling timbers. There are probably going to be a mixture of first, second and third degree burns. First degree burns, not too serious. Uh, second degree burns will cause scarring and blistering. And third degree burns are obviously the most serious uh, where nerve endings are damaged and tissue is destroyed. Treating burn victims is, is a complicated thing uh, even today. And I'm not a doctor, but uh, what I do know is that there, there are options for treating very bad burns were limited. They, they used things like linseed oil and beeswax, uh, vinegar, turpentine uh, to help soothe the wounds. But it was, it was mostly a matter of just keeping the person comfortable and, and, and recovering. Uh, today, we can do skin grafts and all kinds of things. Uh, those options just were not available then. The, the victims with really serious injuries are gonna be scarred for life is the bottom line. Then they probably will have physical reminders of their injuries and limitations for work and quality of life for as, as long as they live. In addition to the burns, there will also be broken bones, cuts, lacerations, concussions, bruises, and other injuries like that. 
So there's a variety of injuries that need to be taken care of. Not everybody was sent to general hospital number two. Uh, some were sent to their, their private homes if they live nearby or to the homes of friends or family who live nearby. Uh, most people did live within walking distance of the, the laboratory because that's just the nature of uh, Richmond in the 1860s to walkable downtown. But people are going to be spread out and start to recover. Um, Josiah Gorgias, who's the chief of ordnance for the Confederacy, is going to write about this incident. And his wife, Amelia, will visit some of the victims and help with their treatment. And he writes, Mama, his, his wife, has been untiring in aiding, visiting, and uh, relieving these poor sufferers and has fatigued herself very much. She has done an infinite deal of good to these poor people. Another newspaper account records that burns are serious and many will die. So the explosion happens on Friday the 13th. And what happens is over the next few days, we have a campaign to provide relief for the victims. Very much like a modern social media campaign. The word gets out about what's happened. And so different groups start to raise money and, and fundraise to help because again, these are working class people. They don't have a lot of resources. Uh, one soldier actually is going to write to the Richmond Sentinel newspaper. As a non-resident of this city, I beg all, all humane people to contribute to so laudable a purpose. The poor wounded creatures are young females who were dependent on their daily labor for their support I send you $5 and I'm only sorry I cannot offer more. The mayor of Richmond is going to establish a committee to raise money for the victims and aid in their recovery. Groups like the YMCA, uh, several churches, all kinds of social groups are gonna raise money. Uh, there are gonna be balls and benefits to raise money so you could send in donations directly to one of these groups, or you could attend one of their fundraising events. So I want to talk about the next couple of days and, and what happens. Um, on the 14th, which Saturday the 14th, which is the next day, um, one of the more famous or well-known victims was Reverend uh, Woodcock, who was a, a minister in town. Um, he was thought to be improving, but passed away. He was in that room when the explosion happened. He was working there, be buried in Hollywood Cemetery. Uh, the youngest victim, who is Eliza Willis, 10 years old, is going to pass away the next day on the 14th. So uh, there were 10 killed immediately. By the next day, the number of killed is up to 29. On the 15th, Mary Ryan passes away. And uh, by the end of the day on the 15th, we're up to 36 dead. That day, the churches will start to collect funds. They'll raise over $2,000 to help these victims and their families. And on the 15th, the first of the funerals start to happen. Um, this is a newspaper article from one of the Richmond newspapers that talks about um, the incident. And there, there's a lot of newspaper accounts that talk about the explosion and then the aftermath for, for these people. And this is um, census information for Mary Ryan. That's her highlighted there, 17 year old female. Um, this is the Ryan family, starting with her father, Michael, on the top. We'll come back to her, but I mean, she's one of the important people to talk about here. Um, Mary Ryan had actually been taken to the home of a friend named Emily Timberlake. And Emily lived on what was then uh, Cary Street. And Mary 
Mary passes away on the 15th at her friend's house. Uh, another girl was also taken there, another victim who was friends with Mary. So the two of them got to spend their last days together. Um, the house stood until the 1950s. And then it was torn down as this area of Richmond was redeveloped, but it stood right at this corner. And I just think it's interesting that um, the house where Mary Ryan died stood until the 50s. And no one probably realized that when it was torn down. Uh, but a local landmark that could have maybe been saved or marked somehow. And this is Mary Ryan's grave in Hollywood Cemetery. Her father purchased uh, some plots in Hollywood Cemetery and she was buried here um, on St. Patrick's Day, March 17th. We don't know how her father afforded this because Hollywood Cemetery was a private cemetery it wasn't a public cemetery or a city cemetery. So he must have gotten some financial support to do this. In the meantime, uh, events keep happening. On the 19th, we're up to 42 who have now passed away. On March 23rd, there is a ball held at the first market we have a couple more passing away. By the 24th, uh, we learn that the ball has raised over $200 to support the victims. And it's now 11 days since the explosion. And the last victim will be Sarah Foster, who will pass away. Um, and so through those middle days of March, lots of funerals. Uh, sometimes six a day in the Richmond cemeteries. And it wasn't always easy because a bad snowstorm came and the ground was frozen. In the meantime, things keep moving on. Uh, the laboratory launches an investigation. They rebuild that structure and the work will continue on the rest of the premises and when that building is completed, uh, it goes back into production. They start using that, that new building right away. Uh, by the end of the month, the laboratory has called for 200 new girls to start working, but they have to be over age 15. And by the end of the month, uh, Confederate soldiers have donated over $2,000 to help the victims. So support is coming in from all over. Um, the YMCA, the mayor's committee, workers at the arsenal, uh, the Ladies Soldiers Aid Society, local women who supported the cause in various ways, uh, churches, synagogues, hospitals, private corporations, even the Glee Club chipped in money. In total, from what I can tell, over $8,000 was raised from all the different contributions from the different groups. So in the end, we have 50 killed, maybe one or two more, one or two less, but I'm, I'm going with 50. That's the number that I come up with when I research this. And most of the dead are buried in three of Richmond's primary cemeteries, Hollywood, Shaco, and Oakwood. But I could not find 20 of them. They're not in those cemeteries. So that led me to question where are the missing 20 victims? And that's what I want to devote the rest of this into. Well, we'll start out with Hollywood Cemetery because it's the most prominent cemetery in Richmond. There is this memorial that was put up, uh, I think in 2012, fairly recently, to honor the victims who were buried there in that cemetery. So in Hollywood, 
Uh, here's Reverend John Woodcock. Talked about him. He, he is in a family plot. His wife is there and other family members. But most of the victims in Hollywood are in plots that, that they're not with family. There's no other family in that cemetery. Like we have Mary, age 12, and Eliza right there. Um, and it seems that individuals donated plots to the families or helped them pay for a plot for their daughter to be laid to rest here. Sarah Marshall, age 67, is the oldest of the victims. One of the few boys or men, uh, Robert Chapel, age 15, is in Hollywood. And um, he has a particularly tough story because he suffered for five days. Um, his skull was crushed by the building collapsing down. And he lingered for five days. And this is Shaco Cemetery, which is a city cemetery. And it goes back to the early decades of Richmond. It's a great place to visit if you like Richmond history, um, Revolutionary War, early founders. John Marshall is in Shaco Cemetery. But um, here at Shaco, there is this monument on the left to the Browns Island victims. And um, you can see Carolyn Zeitheimer's grave is, is just to the right of that. Virginia Mayer, age 12. Wilhelmina Diffenbach is age 15. And the burials at Shaco Cemetery are literally scattered among soldiers. And what it looks like to me is, you know, soldiers are brought in who have died from um, the hospitals. And so you have soldier grave after soldier grave. And if you look at the date of internment, they go in order chronologically. And then all of a sudden, here's one of these Browns Island victims. They were just buried in the order that they were brought in amid the soldiers. And you can obviously tell these are all new headstones. Um, none of these victims had headstones. Uh, these were all put up in the last couple of years. One of the few who is in a family plot in Shaco Cemetery is Alice Johnson age 12, she was one of the ones killed instantly at the time of the explosion. We have Martha Clemens, Margaret Alexander here. Mary Valentine and Margaret Dressley, all buried amid soldiers. Emma Blankenship, age 15. She died six days later. And another one of the few who's buried with family members is Nanny Horan right here. Um, she's actually resting on top of her father who passed away in 1860. And the last cemetery I'm gonna show you here is Oakwood, which is uh, on the east side of Richmond. Oakwood has a huge Confederate section about 15,000 Confederate soldiers here. And that's what you see in the background there. But in front is this memorial to the Browns Island victims. But there's only one buried in, in Oakwood Cemetery. So, like I said, um, looking at the, the numbers from the cemetery records, we can account for 30 burials between those three city cemeteries, but there are 20 missing. And what I wanted to do was see if I could find out where they are and, and find out what I could learn about them. And I started to use a variety of records, uh, the census, city directories, newspapers, uh, obviously city cemetery records and church records, church cemetery records. Um, there's a few other city cemeteries in Richmond at the time. None of them are there as far as the records can say. 
and we know that some of them were, were even full, like the cemetery at St. John's Church, if you're familiar with that, Patrick Henry, Liberty or Death, uh, that cemetery was long full, so there were no burials there. I did start to come across a reference to a bishop's cemetery, but I could not find anything about it. But I thought that might be a good lead because a lot of these victims were Irish and German and they're Catholic and Bishop's Cemetery certainly sounds kind of Catholic. This is a map of Richmond at the time of the Civil War. And I, I looked at every cemetery that was in the city limits. But just outside the city limits, I started to track down what was called Bishop's Cemetery. And literally, it's just over the line in the, the nearby county of Henrico. And what I found is that Bishop's Cemetery was established before the Civil War. It was established for uh, the Irish, Catholics, and Richmond. And in 1892, the cemetery removed a lot of its burials to another Catholic cemetery in the city. And then in the 1970s, the cemetery was entirely closed and all of the internments were removed. So my, my question was, could some of the missing victims that I can't find have been buried in Bishop's Cemetery and then possibly moved. There were two other Catholic cemeteries that were established after the war, Holy Cross and Mount Calvary. And this is, you probably can't read it, but this is a letter from um, the Catholic Diocese of Richmond that talks about in the 70s, they're going to close bishops, sometimes called St. Joseph's Cemetery, and all the interments are going to be moved. And they're trying to contact any family who have descended, uh, have ancestors in that cemetery, and, and tell them that if, if you have a place where you want your relative to go, we'll work with you to arrange that. Um, but the cemetery was closed. It was going to be <laughs> This is horrible. It was going to be used for public housing and a playground after the burials were all removed. And I started to find newspaper articles to talk about this. And sure enough, I went to this is um, Holy Cross Cemetery. And in the background, you can see the the graves and that that's the the main part of the cemetery but you see that that lone marker there on the left in the center and that big open area there they are so the internments from bishop cemetery were moved here in 1971 and because the the you know, records were not very good, and, and if they had headstones, they may not have been in good shape, but there's no headstones for these people. They're just unmarked graves. And then in Mount Calvary Cemetery, again, off in the corner is this little section that I found, and those graves, those headstones predate the establishment of that cemetery. And it turns out these were the burials moved from Bishop's Cemetery. And it's, it's a wider area than what you see. That's just, that's just where they put the ones with headstones. But all around it are burials. There's just no markers. And there were no records kept of this. And so I thought, could it be possible that some of the Browns Island victims who passed away were buried in bishops and then moved to either Mount Calvary or Holy Cross. This is a map that shows Richmond uh, in 1865. And you see that thing that looks like a baseball diamond right there in the middle. 
that is Bishop's Cemetery. And this road running um, sort of up and down to the right of it, that, that's Mechanicsville Turnpike or Route 360. So this is outside the city limits, but that is Bishop's Cemetery. It's not labeled, but I found it on this map. Pay close attention to that shape and look at this. Do you see it? Playground and housing development. Let me go back. You see how the road has this bend in it and the cemetery sits above that bend. Look at the modern city streets, the playground and the housing development. And there it is today, Bishop Cemetery. And you know, <laughs> they never get everybody when they move cemeteries. Um, you all probably know that from studying the, the battles and the, the reburials of soldiers after the war. So who knows, there might still be some there at this playground. Well, as far as finding these, these burials in the cemeteries, I wanted to see if I could really prove this. And I could, because I found Bridget. Bridget Grimes was 13 when she died of her, her injuries 11 days after the explosion. And she was buried in Bishop Cemetery and then later reinterred here in Mount Calvary. And she has a headstone. She's in a family plot. She's there with other relatives. Most of the other victims didn't have any other relatives that they were buried with. They're just individuals. So they were, they're just by themselves. There were no records. So I think Bridget helps prove the case that these victims were probably buried at bishops and then transferred to one of those other two cemeteries. We'll just never know exactly where they are because there's no records. Bridget was born in Ireland. Uh, she lived with her mother, Elizabeth, had one sister. And a uh, newspaper account recalls of her story during the 11 long days of her excruciating suffering, her priest and physicians were untiring in attention. This graph shows you the age of the Browns Island victims. Um, most of them were teenagers. Most of them were girls, women. And there were only a few were older, as you can see here. And there are lingering questions about this. As I think about this, um, did any of the Browns Island victims who survived the explosion go back to work there? They reopened that facility within a couple of weeks. There's a war on, they need to keep production going. We know about two sets of sisters, Martha Daly and her sister, Anne Daly Dodson were both killed, one set of sisters. Uh, another set of sisters, Mary and Caroline Zingingham, uh, Mary was killed and Caroline survived. But how did that impact their family? Did Caroline ever go back to work at the laboratory? There are safety improvements made after the explosion. The report that they produce talks about those issues that I identified. Too many people in the room. Some of them were just hanging out. Uh, too many different things going on in the same space that didn't need to be or shouldn't have been. Um, ensuring that people are doing things properly. No, no banging friction primers on the table. 
really enforcing those regulations. All those things are put into place. They make the minimum age 15. I don't know if that helps a lot, but they were taking 10 year olds before. Um, again, Josiah Gorgas says it is terrible to think that so much suffering should arise from causes possibly within our control. Other questions that, that I have besides where were the remaining victims buried, because we'll never know that. Um, what happened to these people later on? I tried to track some of them down using the census and other records. Catherine Kavanaugh, who was 33 years old in 1863 and was the one who was sweeping the floor behind Mary Ryan, somehow survives. There is a Catherine Kavanaugh in the 1870 census, born in Ireland, and she's listed as keeping house in a Richmond neighborhood. It can't prove it's the same one, but it sure, sure matches. Uh, I, I found a handful of others in census records who were living after the war in Richmond or the surrounding area, but a lot of them I could not. But what happened to them? And think about this. You know, today we commemorate everything. Um, on March 13th, 1864, there was no commemoration of the Browns Island explosion. It's not even mentioned in the newspapers. You know that, hey, a year ago, this, this terrible thing happened. There's nothing. How did that make them feel? Especially the people who lived nearby and you know, they survive it. They, they still live downtown and probably walked by that spot every day. What about the people who had scars and injuries the rest of their lives? How did they tell that story to their family? What memories did they pass on? No newspaper interviewed survivors. Nobody wrote a book or a memoir. No one had their photograph taken as a victim or survivor. And surely somewhere out there, there's a photograph of a Browns Island victim who survived uh, in someone family album or an attic or something. But as the commemoration of the war picks up steam in the 1870s and 80s, we're putting up monuments, we're preserving battlefields, we're having reunions. What about them? There's nothing. I just think it's interesting, kind of forgotten. And so like a lot of things in history, we end up with more questions than answers, but I hope to have shed a little bit more light on, on some of this. I wanna end by doing something a little different here. I hope you'll bear with me. I tried to find out as much as I could about these victims, these 50 people. Uh, some nothing, some I did find a few things. I just wanna cycle through so you can see this is alphabetical. These are the victims who were killed that day or the days after. Where they lived, what family they had, their age, their injuries. Everything I could find. Fredericksburg connections.
So the research is ongoing, but that's what I've been able to find. And um, at this time, I will try to answer any questions, but I hope you enjoyed that kind of a different take on the Browns Island explosion and trying to figure out who these people are and where they are now. I have a question. Sure. Foxstone. Uh, I notice on the newer headstones, it's Captain Sally Tompkins, um, and it has OCR after it. I know she was a, a hospital administrator and a nurse uh, in Richmond, but what does the OCR signify? It's a it's a group, the Order of the Confederate Rose. It's it's. I'm probably going to do this, say this wrong. It's like the Daughters of the Confederacy. It, it's a it, it's a group that helps preserve and um, do genealogy. So it, it's a group that raised the money to put those markers up. Okay. The women's it's a women's history group. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question, Bert. Uh, first of all. Yeah, the loss of 50 people is in, in one fell swoop is really, really horrible. But uh, a facility that's producing like a, a million uh, rounds a month and does that throughout the entire war, it, it got me to thinking, were there other, any other accidents reported at the laboratory uh, from that point on? Or does this represent the only accident? And if it was, given the amount of ammunition produced, um, <laughs> you know, quite a safety record. Yeah, I, I do not know if there were other accidents because um, I haven't researched that. Obviously nothing on the scale of this. I would think if there was any other kind of accident that caused a fatality, I would have seen that, but I didn't. Um, but I agree that, yeah, in the big picture, uh, running through the whole war to produce that much ammunition and, and move that much powder around with only one really big incident, uh, that is pretty good. It is the worst industrial accident in the Confederacy, but I, I don't know about any others there. I don't think there were. Bert, you uh you mentioned that uh, they put out a call for more women to come work after uh, they rebuilt the facility. Is there any like training or anything involved in that? Or they just come in and like it's uh, learned by doing? I think it's a little bit of both, but when they did reopen after the explosion, uh, they do talk about more, there is training in place about how to handle things and what to do and what not do more than there had been before. So they definitely made an effort. By our standards, it wouldn't be enough, but they did make an effort to have some, some training and um, teach them properly how to do things. Okay. And, and one other quick question about, are you the first one to really do research into this or has there been somebody, uh, maybe some of the Confederate groups or somebody that had looked into this before? In other words, are there any other primary sources on this besides not, not the explosion part, but the whole finding out what happened to the victims? A few, a few genealogy groups have um, researched and identified some of these victims like uh, the, the Order of the Confederate Rose and the Daughters of the Confederacy because the the burials in the cemeteries were not marked, but the burial records are, are there. So what they did was they, they went to the cemetery office and they said, well, I'm looking for Mary Ryan. And they pulled out the map and said, well, she's here. And so they went to that spot where there's nothing and they put a marker up for her. So those groups did that, which is great. But as far as uh, trying to find the victims who are not in any of those city cemeteries, um, I think I'm the first one to do that. Well, you certainly did a uh, 
pretty extensive job there. That, that was, <laughs> uh, I, I think they deserve to be remembered, certainly. And it's yeah, nice to yeah. Thanks. Anybody else? All right, that looks like it. No more questions? Bert, thank you very much. I think that was the first time I think anybody here, I certainly had never heard much about it other than the fact that it happened. Uh, and uh, your, your research is uh, really, really fantastic. And, and you're like on the cutting edge here. So uh, <laughs> appreciate, have you, is this like, have you done this before with folks or is this like one of your newer presentations? Um, I, I started this actually about two years ago, and I mean, it's ongoing. I'll, I'll always try to look for more information, but I've exhausted most of what I can easily do and get to. Mm -hmm. So it, this is where it stands and probably will for a while. I just love researching and trying to figure things out. And that's what this comes down to is trying to solve the mystery. Well, thank you so much for uh, sharing your time with us and, and, and your expertise. And uh, I'd like to remind everybody that uh, Bert's an author, and uh, there, there's, I know one in particular that I've read, it's To the Bitter End. That's the book about the surrender of the Confederacy that you talked to us about last time. Savas Beattie uh, publishes it. It's a wonderful, uh, wonderful book, and it, it's really, everybody thinks about Appomattox, but this goes past that into uh, a lot of the other situations that happened after that. So uh, please take a look at some of the things Bert's written. That's probably all your books on the shelf in the back, right? In back of yeah. you there? <laughs> Got a few here. <laughs> so once again, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, next uh, month in December, we're gonna have a presentation from uh, the Manassas National Park staff on the discovery up there at the field hospital of the Manassas battlefield. They discovered uh, some uh, uh, bones and I don't know, you, you would know where, where that was, Bert. When, do you remember when that happened? It was a couple of years ago, right? Yeah, fairly recently. It was, it was a big deal because um, the, the remains that they found were from a field hospital. Mm -hmm. and, and so to have this discovery of you know, an archeological site that's tied to a field hospital that's never really been found or investigated before. So that'll be a good one. So that'll be next month, the second Monday in December, December 14th. Uh, once again, it'll be virtual. Uh, and uh, I'm glad we're able to do this. And I'm glad you were able to share uh, share the time with us and do it from, I guess you're, you're at home now, right? Down at Richardson? Yes. Yeah. Thank you for inviting the uh, Fredericksburg Civil War Roundtable too. It was very enlightening, thank you. Well, you're welcome. You know, I'll tell you one thing. The reason we hadn't done that before is we were kind of stumbling through and trying to get all these things set up. And I think we're kind of, you know, hit our stride now. So you'll all be getting an invitation every time. Okay, uh, great. I hope we're reciprocating that. <laughs> yeah, uh, yes, yes. Roger uh, is, is very uh, good about uh, letting guests in. And uh, I know that uh, we had talked about this and, now, when I don't know how long this is going to be going on, but hopefully we'll be able to share each other's uh, virtual presentations. Well, thanks again. Okay, and and by the way, if you want to see the earlier ones, and this goes for everybody, we're on Facebook, uh, not Facebook, we are on Facebook, but YouTube. If you uh, go to YouTube and put in R V C W R T in the search, all of our old ones will come up too. Oh, okay. Thank you. There's uh, three other ones besides tonight's. All right, Jeff, thank you for everything. Bert, thanks again. And thanks everybody for coming. And hopefully we'll see you all next month.